yet not I, but through Christ in me. Scripture reminds us through the wisdom of Ecclesiastes that to everything there is a season and a time and purpose for everything under heaven. And as we go through the different seasons of life, there are certainly times where the song that Sarah and Caden just sang for us is our prayer. That the only way we were able to get through that season is by saying, not by my own strength, but by Christ at work within me. Pastor Chris and I continue this sermon series through Judges and Ruth, reminding us about God's strength and mercy in turbulent times and in the messiness of humanity. And today, as we pick up the story of Ruth, remember that Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, whose name means pleasant, has just gone through a very difficult season of life. Ruth has as well. Ruth had lost, has lost her husband. Naomi has lost her two sons and husband. And they travel back from the land of Moab, where Ruth is from, to the land of Israel in Bethlehem. And here, Naomi has declared that her name is no longer Naomi, but it is now Mara, which means bitter. And all she can see is the bitterness of life. She can no longer see the pleasantness of God and of life. She is in a very dark night of the soul. And Ruth, whose name means friend, has been the compassionate friend to Naomi. And now we're going to introduce another character into the story whose name is Boaz. And Boaz is going to show us the strength of the Lord at work. So turn with me now to Ruth chapter 2. And hear the word of the Lord as the Spirit speaks to us this morning. And I invite you as we read through chapter 2 to pay attention to the providential care of God at work in this particular part of the story. Now Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a prominent rich man of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain behind someone in whose sight I might find favor. She said to her, go, my daughter. So she went. She came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. As it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz came from Bethlehem. He had, he had said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, to whom does this young woman belong? The servant who was in charge of the reapers answered, she is a Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. So she came and she has been on her feet from early this morning until now, without resting even for a moment. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped and follow behind them. I have ordered the young men not to bother you. If you get thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Then she fell prostrate and with her face to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds, and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, May I continue to find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, even though I am not one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some of this bread and dip your morsel in the sour wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he heaped up for her some parched grain. She ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she had got up to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, 
Let her glean even among the standing sheaves and do not reproach her. You must also pull out some handfuls for her from the bundles and leave them for her to glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. She picked it up and came into town and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gleaned. Then she took out and gave her what was left over after she herself had been satisfied. Her mother-in-law said to her, where did you glean today and where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, the name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, blessed be he by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a relative of ours, one of the nearest kin. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay close by my servants until they have finished all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it is better, my daughter, that you go out with his young women. Otherwise, you might be bothered in another field. So she stayed close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, there's some biblical farming practices we need to understand in order to understand what's happening within this story. But let me back up even one place more. Don't forget that all of this is, in, all of that's happening in the story is happening in the time of the judges, when people have forgotten the commands of God. They have forgotten what is happening of, with God's presence at work in their lives. And one of the things that they're forgetting is this command when it comes to harvest season. This command to leave a portion of the outer edges of the field untouched by the harvesters. This was a law laid out in Leviticus and Deuteronomy for the poor. It was basically biblical welfare, if you will. <laughs> for those who didn't have their own land, had no other ways of obtaining food, God had said to his people, leave that untouched for the poor and the widows so you can care for people as needed. Another part of that law was as people were gleaning the fields, meaning as they're harvesting the wheat and chopping it down and pulling it up, they have to collect bundles in their arms, right? Guess what happens when you collect a lot of bundle of things? Things drop. <laughs> and they're meant to leave whatever falls out of their arms on the ground so that those who come to reap behind them can do so at ease. So this is what Ruth is doing in the story. She's following behind the people who are cutting up the wheat, and as they drop things, she's picking them up in order to feed her mother-in-law. So we see through Ruth's actions once again that she continues to be that compassionate friend that Pastor Chris talked about last week to her mother-in-law and caring for her in a time of need. But don't forget, because scripture doesn't let us forget, that Ruth is a Moabite. She is a foreigner. It's repeated over and over and over again, almost to the point of hilarity. At one part of scripture, it says, when Boaz asked his servant who this woman is, he says, that is Ruth the Moabite from the land of Moab, in case you missed the fact earlier that she was a foreigner. Here we see God's providential care at work. So for a while, Ruth has been a compassionate friend to Naomi, Ruth also needs a friend. She is a foreigner in a new land with no other people to care for her or protect her. Now enter Boaz. And Boaz, in a sense, is an allegory for the way that Christ enters into our lives, the way that God will care and provide for us in our times of need. Scripture tells us that Boaz takes notice of Ruth, that he sees her in her work and asks who she is, where she comes from. 
And I've been and in and read and been a part of numerous Bible studies that have focused on the story of Ruth. And we get to this particular point of the story, most of the leaders of these studies point out that what no, what made Boaz notice Ruth was her compassionate actions, her work, strong work ethic, or maybe she was nice to look at. <laughs> but scripture doesn't give us any physical attributes for Ruth. And the more that I encounter this story, the more I realize that if we are to diminish what made Boaz take notice of Ruth just to her actions alone, then we are failing to notice God at work in this story. And we're failing to notice God at work through Boaz. Boaz is actually following the practices laid out for the people of Israel. So we know that Boaz is a man of God. That Boaz, in a time where most of the people of Israel are forgetting who God is, is very much remembering who God is. And Boaz is paying attention and listening to God. And we know that because Boaz is seeing the outsiders amongst his midst. But there's more to Boaz's story that I love about this part of Ruth, that if you don't know your Bible stories, you would miss. Or if you don't pay attention to the genealogies that are in our scripture, you would also miss. Why else does this man from Bethlehem notice Ruth? Because he comes from a family line of outsiders. Boaz, we're told in the genealogies that are in scripture, is the son of another outsider woman, and her name was Rahab. And if you remember the story of Rahab that's laid out in Joshua chapter 2, you know that Rahab was a woman in the city of Jericho in the time of Joshua. And it's Rahab who welcomes in the spies that have come into the city to spy out the land so that the people of Israel can take Jericho and enter into the land that God has promised them. It's Rahab that keeps them safe. It's Rahab that puts the scarlet cord outside her window so they know when it's safe to enter the city once again. And it's Rahab who requests protection for her family as they enter into Jericho and the promised land. And we know that Rahab is granted that protection, and she marries into the tribe of Judah, of which Boaz is a part of and comes from. So Boaz's background itself lends itself to notice the outsiders in his midst. His compassionate heart comes from his own mother. Boaz notices those that only God would notice. And he cares for Ruth. And multiple times in this part of the story, when he interacts with Ruth, it says that she was fully satisfied that she was fill, given enough food to fill her up and there was still some left over. It's a highlight of the character of God. Throughout scripture, the psalmist prays God for giving us more than we even need, more than we could ask or imagine. When we get to the Gospels and we hear the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, there was enough for everyone with still stuff left over. Our God not only provides for our needs, but if we pay attention, we'll notice that God provides above and beyond what we actually need. Boaz shows us this truth. We see Ruth being given everything she needs because Boaz was paying attention to God at work in his life as a protector and provider to his lands and his people. One of the things that is often a challenge for us as people of faith today is paying attention to that voice of the Lord in our lives. There is so much noise, so much busyness, so many things that easily distract us that we aren't able to distinguish the voice of God above everything else. And oftentimes I hear people ask me, how do I even know if it is God talking or not? 
We need friends to help us discern that when we think we do hear the voice of God. We need prayer to discern that. But more often, I have come to learn as Bob Goff, who is a Christian lawyer and speaker and someone who has taught me a lot about the joy of the Lord and being a friend to people, Bob Goff has a line in his book, Love Does, that says, I have learned that it's not that I am unable to hear the voice of God. It's that I'm selective in my hearing, and I tend to tune God out. And he writes in this particular chapter of the book, I don't think God is giving me the silent treatment because he's mad at me. I think God's hope and plan for us is pretty simple to figure out. For those who resonate with formulas, here it is. Add your whole life, your loves, your passions, your interests together with what God has said he wants us to be about in this world. That's your answer. If you want to know the answer to the bigger question, what's God's plan for me, for the whole world? Buckle up. It's you. It's us. We're God's plan, and we always have been. We aren't just supposed to be observers, listeners, or have a bunch of opinions. We're not here to let everyone know that we agree, what, who we agree with or who we don't agree with. Instead, tell me about the God you love. Tell me about what he has inspired uniquely in you. Tell me about what you're going to do about it. And a plan for your life will be pretty easy to figure out from there. I guess what I'm really trying to say is that most of us don't get an audible voice from heaven, but it's better than that if we really pay attention because we get to be God's plan for the whole world by pointing people towards God. God's power is alive in us. That's what Boaz teaches us. That's what Ruth teaches us in this part of the story. Because Boaz is pointing Ruth toward God. Ruth, who made that vow to Naomi just a chapter ago of your people will be my people, my God will be your God. Now she is encountering that God through the person of Boaz. And Boaz is showing her that God is a God who satisfies her every need. That God is a God, as he says in scripture, that longs to wrap himself around you as a mother hen covers her chicks with his wings. For there is safety and comfort. That God is a God who does not forsake you or leave you. Boaz, as you will hear later, is also going to be known as a kinsman redeemer for Ruth and Naomi. Pastor Chris will lead you through that part of the story. Stay tuned for chapters three and four. But Boaz is pointing us to the future of Jesus' presence among us. Because it's Jesus who continues every single day to invite us to the table with him. It's Jesus not only who invites us to sit at the table with him and be filled beyond measure, but it's Jesus who also prompts us to remember to set a table for, to set a place for somebody else at the table. To also welcome in the stranger, welcome in the foreigner, foreigner, include them in your lives and tell them about this Jesus, this God who has made a huge impact on your life. This is God at work within us, that through our words, through our actions, through our prayers, through our presence, people are able to bear witness to the spirit of God at work in this world. Too often, we think God's abandoned us, God's forgotten us. God is very much still alive in our midst. Do you know him? Do you see him? Do you hear him? You might just see Jesus in the person sitting next to you today. <laughs> you might just see Jesus in the person at the grocery store or in your neighborhood. You might just see Jesus if you look in the mirror today. Friends, this is the good news of the gospel. <laughs> God is alive, and you are a part of that big, grand story of salvation. 
God is alive, and it's to him that we give all the glory. It's to him that we're able to do abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine by the power of the Spirit at work within us. And to that we say thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we are grateful for these stories of our ancestors that remind us that when all hope seems lost, when we're in a season of despair or drought or famine, that you remind us that you are still present. Lord, we know that you are alive in our midst today, that your spirit is at work in this very room right now. And so as we enter into this time of prayer, as we reflect in the song that's about to be sung for us, help us to attune ourselves to your voice in our midst. Help us to hear you and how you are prompting us to not only grow in our relationship with you, but to be Christ to those in our midst today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen.